I tried making my own D&D dice with the intention of making a video called Making D&D Dice was so much easier than I thought. Well, it certainly did not go that way, but I did end up with a bunch of dice that I'm super happy with and I've left links to all the supplies I'd recommend down in the description. In this video, I'm going to go over exactly how to start making your own dice as a complete beginner, show you all the mistakes that I made so you can avoid them, and show you the results that you can expect. And I'm also gonna show you the sponsor of this video, which is me. I've launched a Patreon and there's already some fun stuff over there with lots more planned, including this, but more on that later. Welcome to the table, I'm Kelly and we're gonna roll the dice on making some dice. Oh, this would be fours, this would be fours. So I got some resin, mixed it up, did my first pour, and 24 hours later, I was pretty happy with the results. Whoa, 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 whoa. You just skipped over so many things, and also, what the heck is that contraption? Right, sorry, from the beginning. I've thought about trying to make my own dice for a while, but because I don't have a heated garage or a basement, or somewhere that I can let the resin cure that isn't in my living space, I didn't think it would be an option for me. Resin epoxy fumes are not good for you, so letting it cure in my living room didn't seem like a good option. I did have a dry place out in this dilapidated building that we call a shed, but epoxy resin needs to cure at a minimum temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, and right now it goes down to about 2 degrees at night, so I needed a way to keep it warm. I thought about building some sort of heat controlled box, but the cost and complexity put it out of reach. But as usual, the solution was much simpler. It turns out I didn't need a heater and therefore a complicated heat controller to turn it on and off. I just needed a small enough heat source that would keep the box just warm enough. I used this plastic storage tub I had lying around, a $10 clamp light from Home Depot, a 60 watt incandescent bulb, some towels for insulation, and a barbecue thermometer to monitor the temperature. Now obviously be extremely careful with this because incandescent bulbs get hot and you're putting it in a confined space. My bin is up on a piece of wood so some air can escape which would prevent it from ever getting too hot. I would definitely recommend leaving a gap at the bottom. The size of bulb you'll need will heavily depend on the temperature outside and the size of your bin. I started with a 40 watt bulb and then checked the temperature every 10 minutes to make sure it wasn't getting too hot, also feeling around with my hand to make sure nothing inside was getting too hot or melting. Due to the air temperature, I found that I needed to move up to a 60 watt bulb. I repeated the tests, and once I was satisfied that nothing was getting too hot and nothing was at risk of touching the bare bulb, I felt safe leaving it unattended. If a 40 watt bulb is still producing too much heat, you can either prop up the edge of your bin a little further to let more air escape, or you can get a little handheld dimmer and dim down your bulb. Now that I had my heated box, I was ready to start pouring. Almost. Remember how I said epoxy resin fumes were bad for you? You should definitely wear a respirator while making dice. I'm not a safety expert, but from what I read, I needed a respirator that was OV rated, which means it's rated for organic vapors. I got a P100 OV respirator, which was the highest rated respirator I could find. Now I was ready to start pouring. The absolute best tip I got, which was mentioned many times during my research, was to heat the resin bottles ahead of time in a warm water bath and keep the mixing cup in the warm water bath while mixing. Not that kind of bath. This is by far the best way to reduce bubbles without using a pressure pot. And as I would soon learn, bubbles are my greatest enemy. Epoxy resin comes in two parts, the resin and the hardener. These two parts get mixed together, which causes a chemical reaction, and then they become hard. I used a couple of takeout containers, filled them with hot water from the tap, and let the bottle sit in it for 10 minutes. I can't overstate how important this is. I tried it cold, and it was an absolute bubbly mess. Heating the two parts causes it to become less viscous, so the bubbles can escape more easily. I tried two highly rated resins and compared them both. In the end, they were fairly similar, and I had good and bad pours with both. But one of them comes with a bunch of other stuff that I think makes it a better beginner kit. After I took my first sets out of the molds, I was super happy. I tried three different molds and we'll talk about that in a second, but first, look at these. I felt really excited coming back after the 24 hour cure time and cracking the molds open. It felt so crazy that I just poured some liquids and random powder into a mold and 24 hours later, I had some really cool dice. There were some bubbles, sure, but they seemed like they were 90% of the way there. And after getting something this good on my first pour, I was 100% confident I was gonna be making perfect dice from here on out and that no one actually needed a pressure pot and that this this video was going to be the easiest one yet. Oh, you sweet summer child. I spent the next couple of weeks pouring set after set, finding new mistakes to make each time, and somehow getting worse results than my very first pour. Heat, mix, pour, cure, open, disappointment, 
repeat. I was consistently getting dice that looked cool and were 90% perfect, but I just couldn't get rid of those bubbles and get that last 10%. I got more and more frustrated and I thought about giving up on this video idea altogether. But I'd done all this research, made and learned from so many mistakes, and done all this testing that it felt like it still might be useful to someone, even if I couldn't get the results I'd hoped for. So before giving up, I decided to just polish and paint my first set, and I'm so glad I did. But before I show you that, and my favorite set that I've made so far, I want to share all the little tips and tricks I learned and which mold and resin I would buy if I started again. I tested three different molds at different price points. Now there's a whole thing about some dice molds using fonts without proper licensing, but all these molds have pretty common looking fonts which look to either be free to use or could easily be licensed, so I wouldn't have any issues with using these to make dice for my own personal use. If I was going to make dice to sell, I'd want to make my own molds anyways so I could have complete control. Making your own molds would also be far cheaper. I actually did order some silicone to try making my own molds, but given that I couldn't even get the results I wanted from these, I didn't try. Maybe I will in the future though. The three molds I tried were the individual cap molds that have a vent in the top, a cheaper slab mold, and a more expensive slab mold. I really didn't like the individual cap molds with the vent. I found it really difficult to get the cap to sit properly so it wouldn't leave a seam. I also found it irritating to have to use the pipettes to fill the mold, which really limited the types of pours I could do. I was able to get pretty good results out of it with limited bubbles, but overall I found it pretty annoying to work with, so I wouldn't recommend it. This cheap slab mold actually really impressed me, and I would 100% recommend it if it weren't for one fatal flaw. The lid doesn't line up correctly with the mold on the D20, so it leaves an elevated edge on the one side. I tried weighting it down so the lid would press tighter, but it still gave the same result. I think the cutout just isn't the correct size. I saw some reviews that said people were able to make perfect dice with it, and then a couple other that had the same issues as me. It's too bad though because it produced excellent results for all the other dice. I found that for some reason air bubbles stuck to this type of silicone less than the other slab molds, so it produced dice with less bubbles. It has also lasted through 10 pours without any degradation and it's significantly cheaper. It was so close to being great, but obviously if it can't make a decent D20 then I can't recommend it. Which means that unfortunately the most expensive option was the best, but it definitely wasn't perfect either. This slab mold is hefty, which did did inspire confidence, and it produced the cleanest results straight from the mold. The sides that didn't have bubbles came out with a perfect glass finish that didn't need any polishing. It also has really deep numbers, which means you can sand off a lot of material without sanding off the numbers, which makes it easier to remove air bubbles. Despite the build quality, I did get a small tear after the fifth pour when demolding my D20. It doesn't really show up on the dice, but I was surprised that this was the first to tear, even though it feels like the most solid one. I think I must have also scratched the mold when demolding the D20 because now there's raised lines on the 19 and 7 sides. These can be sanded down, but I was still surprised to see how quickly the mold started showing signs of wear. Despite all that, I'm still really happy with the results it produced. Now before I tell you about which resin I'd recommend, I want to tell you about this and all the exciting stuff I've got planned for the Patreon. I got this hat made a few years ago and I've worn it almost every day, which is why it actually looks like this now. <laughs> I've got tons of compliments and it's been a conversation starter with people that recognize what it is. If you don't play a D20 RPG, then it just looks like a geometric shape. But if you do, then it's kind of like you're part of a secret club. I really love this hat, which is why I wanted to make it the first piece of merch that I released. This one's available at powerwordspill.com and if you join the Patreon at the $5 tier, you get access to the limit edition one, which has Power Word Spill and Session Zero on the back. There will only be a hundred of these limited edition ones made. There's also extra content at the $5 tier. There's a Q&A video up there right now, and then once a month I'm going to be doing something called The Power Word Show. The title is still a work in progress. This will be a longer format show with different segments, and I want you all to be involved in helping me decide on those segments. For the first show coming out in early March, I'll be doing Plotline Hotline, which will be a segment where you can write in with plot or story-based problems from your campaign and I'll brainstorm some ideas to help you solve it. Hopefully this will give everyone story inspiration for their own campaigns. I'll also have a general Q&A segment, an in the news segment with exciting TTRPG related releases and announcements, and a deep dive segment from one of my videos from the previous month. For this first one I'll be going through all the dice sets that I made, talking about exactly how I made them and the mistakes I made with each set and what the result of that mistake was. The show will be available in both audio and video formats. There's also a bunch of other perks there 
there, including store discounts and access to future digital resources. So head to the link down in the description to check it out. All right, let's finish these dice. For the resin, I tested Magic Resin and Let's Resin. They were both fairly similar, but Magic Resin does specifically mention bubble release, and it did seem to be slightly runnier after heating, which meant less bubbles. I also like that it came with everything you needed to get started, including gloves, silicone mixing cups, stir sticks, and color powders. Even though the bottles are smaller, you still get enough to make six full sets of dice, which should give you an idea if you want to keep going with the hobby. I read that mixing with a silicone stir stick makes a big difference in reducing bubbles, so I tested a silicone stick and wooden stir sticks. I did notice slightly less bubbles using the silicone stick, so if you can find one at Michael's or your local dollar store, it would be worth picking one up. Although the biggest difference came from my stirring technique. Stirring and pouring are the most crucial parts when it comes to making dice without a pressure pot. A few tutorials I watched said to pour slowly from the bottles, making the resin run down the sides of the mixing cup instead of straight in. I found that this does help reduce bubbles. The other thing that can help besides preheating the resin in a water bath is to warm up the molds. I leave the molds in my heated box for a couple hours before doing the pour to make sure they're nice and warm. The resins I tried are both one-to-one -one ratio by volume, which means you fill up the cup in equal amounts part A and part B. I found that it usually takes about 30 milliliters to make a set of seven dice, but I like to pour 40 milliliters just to make sure I don't run out, and because the cups I have don't have marks at 15 milliliters and I don't want to just guess. So I pour up to the 20 milliliter line with part A and then up to the 40 milliliter line with part B. Then I stir slowly so that I don't introduce any bubbles, but not too slowly otherwise it won't actually mix properly and the resin won't cure. If you take your dice out of the mold and they're soft or liquidy, it means that either the ratios were wrong or the resin wasn't mixed well enough. When you start to stir, you'll see streaks as the two liquids mix and then when it's completely mixed, you shouldn't see any more streaks. I usually stir slowly for about 10 minutes. Once it's stirred, now you can add your alcohol inks or color powders. I had some pearlescent mica powder left over from my potion lamp and I've also been using the powders that came with the resin. I also picked up this box of alcohol inks and it's been very fun to play with them both. I definitely recommend adding alcohol inks even if you're adding mica powder because the alcohol will help to further thin out the resin and help release bubbles. I've been having a lot of fun playing with double pours, so I pour half of my mixed resin into another cup and add two different dyes or powder to one and dye to the other. One thing to note is that the powders do seem to cause more bubbles. The cleanest dice set I've made were without powders, only alcohol inks. But I just love the swirls and sparkles that come from using the powders, so I'll take the bubbly but swirly dice. Now for the crucial part pouring into the mold. The advice here is pretty consistent, pour high and slow. The more narrow the stream is, the less likely that bubbles will make it into the mold. I also try to avoid pouring right onto a number because I've found that that can trap bubbles. Instead, I try to pour into the space next to the number. I overfill the mold a bit just so the resin is peaking above the edge of the mold. And just before you put the lid on, use a lighter to pop any surface bubbles. Quite a few people said to put some resin on the lid first to help avoid bubbles on the top face, but I found that that didn't really help, so I just just carefully put the lid on. Instead of pressing down on the lid, just gently wiggle it back and forth so that the keys settle into the notches of the mold. Don't press down on the mold, otherwise it'll cause large cavities in the dice when your mold lifts up over the course of the curing process. Also, once you put the lid on, do not take it off again. I learned that the hard way. As soon as you peel up the lid at all, it'll draw the resin up out of the mold and you'll end up with large cavities. I also saw some advice that said to add weight on top and that does help reduce flash but I found that having some extra resin in the mold helped in the event of any air escaping. If a bubble escapes and there's extra resin at the top, it'll just draw more in to fill the hole. But if the extra resin has been squeezed out, it just leaves a big hole. So I found that going without weight on top leads to better results. Now put the lid on your heat box, get your towels on there, and wait 24 hours for the resin to do its thing. Now comes the most exciting part and potentially the most disappointing. Crack your mold open and see how they turned out. If there aren't any large holes in them, you can move on to sand and polishing. If there are, you might be able to fix them with some UV resin. UV resin is great because it cures in just a few minutes under UV light. You can either leave it in the sun or use a UV flashlight. I had one already for my props video and it worked great. Now on to sanding and polishing. The first step is to carefully clean up the edges using a utility knife. Work your way along the edge, trying to keep the blade at the same angle as the face. Once the edges are cleaned up, then move on to sanding. Most people recommend Zona papers for sanding and polishing, which is what I got 
and they've been great. I found I usually only need to do the top face and sometimes the face is next to the top face, particularly on the D20. Just start at the roughest and work your way up through the colors. I've been following Ribonator's advice, which is an excellent YouTube channel by the way. I dip the dice in water and then go up and down 10 times, left and right 10 times, and then in a circle 10 times. Then on the two finest grit levels, I repeat this three times to give it some extra polish. The first time I did a full set, I didn't think my hand would ever return to normal, but it got easier after that. By the way, I've linked Ribonator's YouTube channel down in the description, as well as all the other resources that I found helpful. Now the last step, which is the most fun because it's easy and it instantly turns your resin crystals into finished dice, painting the numbers. I grabbed some acrylic paint and some fine brushes from my local dollar store and carefully painted in the numbers. If you don't have any bubbles, then you can be less accurate and just rub the excess away with your thumb. But for faces that you do have bubbles, you'll need to paint carefully so that the bubbles won't ruin the shape of your number. I've learned a ton throughout this process, but the absolute biggest lesson was learning that imperfect dice are still really cool and satisfying to make. After demolding every set, I was inspecting them up close and finding every flaw. Oh, there's a bubble there. This face has lots of bubbles. There's a bubble in the zero. But then I started looking at the dice I've bought and I started seeing that they have little imperfections too. Some of my favorite sets that I've been playing with for years have little imperfections that I've never noticed. Because when you're playing, you're not holding them up to your eye inspecting them, you're watching the pretty colors careen across the table from an arm's length. Once I let go of that need to chase the last 10% of quality, I became excited again, and I've made some really cool, imperfect sets that I really like playing with, and everyone I show them to notices the cool swirls and fun patterns before they notice any of the imperfections. So with that, here's the first set of dice I ever poured, and my favorite set that I've made so far, in all their imperfect glory. There are so many different techniques that I'm really excited to try, and I could see myself making a custom set of dice for each of my characters. Are you gonna try making your own dice? Let me know down in the comments. After you make a fresh set of dice, you're probably gonna need a character to play. I love using non-fantasy movie characters as D&D character inspiration because I've found it leads to a more unique character. You can check out this video here for some tips on how to make a unique character inspired by a movie character. I appreciate you.